in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. And as always, it's great to be with you. I'm your host, Father Ed Brew, OMB, Oblate of the Virgin Mary. And as always, it's great to be with all of you. And today we celebrate a, an important solemnity. Today we celebrate the solemnity of St. Peter and St. Paul. And that will be our topic for today. As always, we like to start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary has many wonderful, wonderful titles. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. So let's turn to Mary and ask Mary to help us to really go deeper in the knowledge and love of our Holy Catholic Church as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now we'd like to invite to be with us our spiritual director. And our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. And he has many, many wonderful titles. The Holy Spirit is known as the Paraclete. The Holy Spirit is also known in the Catechism of the Catholic Church as our, as the gift of gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our souls. Holy Spirit is also, the Holy Spirit is also known as the counselor and our consoler. And if that were not enough, the Holy Spirit is also known as the interior master. St. Saint, Saint Paul says we don't really know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with Ineffable groans so that we can say Abba, Abba, which means daddy or father. So let's pray the classical prayer to the Holy Spirit. And that prayer is, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit, we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray
pray for us. Saint Ignatius, pray for us. Saint Michael the Archangel, pray for us. Saint Gabriel, pray for us. Saint Raphael, pray for us. Saint Peter, pray for us. Saint Paul, pray for us. Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and for the Holy Spirit. Amen. So my friends, I'd like to pray for all of you and your special intentions. And I'll be praying for all of you as I place you on the altar in the greatest of all prayers. That prayer is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. There's no greater prayer in the whole world than the holy sacrifice of the mass it is the prayer par excellence that's right it's the prayer the prayer par excellence the holy sacrifice of the mass and these would be my intentions first i'd like to pray that all of us would be open that we be open to the workings of the Holy Spirit. And we would perhaps pray this prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come to the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My second intention will be I'd like to pray for all of your families and my family too. Especially for the conversion of our family members. And for their sanctification. and salvation for our family members, for their conversion, sanctification, and salvation. And then I'd like to pray, as always, I'd like to pray for the those who are dying. that those who will be dying today, that they'll be saved, that they will be saved. Many are not prepared to die and to meet their maker. Let's pray that they would open up their hearts to God's infinite mercy, which Jesus says is so true. What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What would it profit a man? We gained millions and millions of dollars, land, terrain, cars, everything on a human level, on a materialistic level, and then we lose our soul. What's the purpose? So, let's follow the words of our Lord. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything else will be given to you besides. And I'd like to offer a last intention. 
the pray for our teenagers. Some of you have teenagers, Bev and Carmen and various members in our family here have teenagers. On Tuesday, we had our last meeting for the June session of the teenagers, but I've decided to extend it all the way into July. So the 11th of July, not the 4th of July, because that's our holiday, but the 11th of July will be starting another, another summer program for the young people. We're in the process of purchasing new Bibles to give to our young people. And then we'll also give them a scapular so we'll start off our celebrate start off our July program by giving two gifts, a new Bible, and I'll bless it, and we'll have a special ceremony, and then we'll also give we'll also give a scapular. And what I'm doing now is I'm in the process of writing out a new program, The Spiritual Exercises for Teens. And I was able to write out the first week of the four-week program. So I ask you to pray that God will give me a lot of inspiration. And I've got a couple of people helping me to format a new program, a spiritual exercise program for the teens. So pray for this. We'll meet on Tuesdays once again, July 11th, 18th, 25th, and August 1st. Invite all of you to uh, consider inviting the teens. You'll be 13 to 17. 13 to 17. So, Pray that we have the spirit of St. John Bosco to be able to bring the young people to Christ in these very difficult times. Very difficult times. So uh, just uh, pray for it. Many of you are enthousi enthusiastic about this. So we'll give them a Bible, and why not introduce them to uh, Ignatian spirituality on their level? I'm not going to force them to do a holy hour, but they can do 10 minutes. And if they want to go beyond the 10 minutes, so much the better. So I tell you people, if you do your holy hour, fine. If you want to do an hour and a half, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm doing my hour and a half, heading toward two hours, God willing. The more time that we can spend with God, the better. Of course, never neglecting our responsibilities. That's why we should all have some type of spiritual direction. So, my friends, today we celebrate the solemnity of Saints Peter and Paul. This is not a holy day of obligation, but if you can go to Mass, so much the better. It's a Mass from which you'll have three readings. There will be the Gloria. There will also be the Profession of Faith. We'll be renewing our faithfulness to the Holy See. In our con celebrated mass at 12 noon in our parish of St. Peter Chanel. So, this is a wonderful, glorious day. So, I'd like to start off by talking about the solemnity of St. Peter and St. Paul. by means of a personal anecdote 
and a little bit of church architecture. And it's this. If any of you have ever had the privilege of going to Rome, the Eternal City, where I spent about seven years in preparation for Holy Orders, the biggest church in Christendom is the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome. It's an enormous church. It's the biggest. And it is the most visited church in the world. So much so that there's actually called the Vatican City, which is its own city. Now, if you have been at the Basilica of St. Peter, you'll notice that the plaza, in the Italian piazza, is very big. But before you enter into the glorious church, better said basilica, just that you're aware the word basilica comes from Greek basileus, which means the house of the king. It's good that you know that. Basilica means the residence of the house of the king, and that king is Jesus Christ, the Lord of lords and the king of kings. So as you're, you're probably about, I'd say about a hundred yards from the entrance, the main door, the main entrance of the Basilica of St. Peter, you'll notice that there are two columns or two pillars on which you're going to see two majestic statues. Two majestic statues. And on the top of one is a statue of a man that has a big sword. And the top of the other one is a man who has uh, a big key. The man with the sword is St. Paul the Apostle. The man with the key is St. Peter. And those are the two saints that we celebrate today. The two saints that we celebrate today. Why the sword? Why the key? Let's start with the, the man with the key. That refers to Simon Peter. And the context of that is the following. Jesus was in Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asked the apostles the question, who are you? Rather, who am I? And the apostles said that some people say that you're John the Baptist who has returned Another would be Elijah, another would be Jeremiah, another would be one of the prophets of the old has returned. In other words, the public opinion on Jesus was all wrong. True that Jesus is the greatest of all the prophets, and he has the prophetic spirit of preacher, no doubt about that. But Jesus is not simply a prophet. Then after that, Jesus asks them a question. Very important question. He, and he asks, who am I? 
And I think that's a good question for all of you. Who is Jesus Christ for you? Who is he? Of course, there are many Christological titles, many titles that we can give. Many titles we can give, many Christological titles. But Peter speaks up. Peter speaks up. Sophie has written, He is my best friend. That has been one of my favorite titles over the past few years. Sophie said, He is my best friend. Beautiful. And I hope and pray that he always will be. Jesus, of course, at the Last Supper said to the apostles, I call you friends. But in that context, Peter raises his voice. We already see that he's the prince of the apostles. And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. <coughs> now, Jesus responded with these words related to that statue with the big key in the plaza of St. Peter's. Jesus says, you are Peter. And the, the word in Greek is Petra. Petra in Greek means, actually means rock. You are Petra or rock. And then Jesus says, you are Petra, you are rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Whatever you declared bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you declare loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. So in that moment, Jesus was preparing Peter for what is called the primacy. That when Jesus will eventually leave the world, he will not leave us as orphans. He will leave us the Holy Spirit. And Jesus will also leave us. He'll always leave us his church, which is known as the mystical body. The church is the mystical body of Christ. The mystical body of Christ. So, in that moment, Jesus was already prophesying that he would be with us always until the end of time <coughs> by means of his ministers, by means of the church, by means of his mystical body. Now, to confirm the primacy of Peter, and there have been 266 successors of Christ from the very beginning of the church, is the gospel that we have for the vigil last night, the vigil of the Solemnity of St. Peter, St. Paul. So there we have the passage of Peter being Peter professing Jesus as the Christ, the Son, the living God. And Jesus bestowing upon Peter the keys. The keys. Now we jump to after Jesus has risen from the dead. This is another key Petrine passage, passage of an encounter between Jesus and Peter and what Peter will be called to do.
And this can be found in John chapter 21. Peter is the leader. He says, as he's on Lake Galilee, I'm going fishing. Some of the apostles say, we'll go with you. So Peter goes out with some of his companions, and they're fishing the whole night. At least they're trying to fish. They catch nothing. And then, as the sun is rising, there's a man on the shore. And he asks Peter and his companions, My little children, have you caught anything? They say no. Then he says, Throw your net on the other side of the boat. Well, they've got nothing to lose. They haven't caught anything except the wind ever, all night. So they obey the Lord and they drop the nets. And the nets are filled up with so many fish that the Peter has to call another one of the boats and his companions to help them to bring the miraculous catch of fish inside the boat. Eagle Eye John says, It's the Lord. And Peter, filled with enthusiasm, he girds himself and he throws himself into the lake. They're not far from the shore. Only about a hundred yards. And then Peter, with the apostles, draw close to the risen Lord Jesus. And no one doubts that it's the Lord. You know, the Lord is carrying out a very beautiful gesture. He knows that these fishermen are famished because they've been working hard all night. <coughs> So he's prepared for them some fish and some bread. And he says, take and eat. The apostles are relishing being with the Lord. How we should long, my friends, to be with the Lord, to relish our presence with the Lord. To relish, to relish our presence to be with the Lord. Then after Jesus <coughs> has given them breakfast, and Jesus takes Peter apart, and he's taking a walk with, with Peter along the shore of Lake Alley, and walking behind them is John the Evangelist. And try to make a contempt and an Ignatian contemplation. Try to imagine this. Imagine that you're walking side by side with Jesus Christ. You're walking with him. That can be part of your contemplation today. And As Peter's walking side by side with Jesus, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. So they're walking further and Peter, walking side by side with Jesus, Jesus stops and looks at Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. 
feed my lambs. They're walking a little bit further. Jesus stops and looks in the eyes of Peter. Peter, do you really love me? And that hurt Peter because he asked him a third time. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. He said, Peter, when you were young, you used to go, you used to tighten your belt and go wherever you wanted. But later on, they will take you against your will and bind you. Jesus was saying this, making a prophecy, indicating the way that Peter would glorify the Lord at the end of his life. Now, all during that conversation, John the Evangelist was walking behind Peter and Jesus. Peter turns around and says, what about him? Perhaps Peter didn't really feel worthy to have that responsibility because he failed the Lord and John the Evangelist was more faithful. <coughs> Jesus says, basically, don't worry about him. You follow me. Follow me. So I purposely pulled out those two those two biblical passages, those two biblical passages, which was Peter's profession in Caesarea Philippi. Which can be found in Matthew chapter 16. Verse 13 to 39, which is the gospel for today. And once again, I invite all of you. Some of you have already responded. Who is Jesus for you? Sophie said he is my best friend. And I, that's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful relationship with Christ. Perhaps some of you have other names for Christ. Maybe, maybe for you, he's the Good Shepherd. Maybe for you, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Maybe for you, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Maybe for you, Jesus is the Savior. Maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe for you, he's the son of Mary. Maybe for you, Jesus is the master, the teacher, the master. Maybe for you, Jesus is the divine physician. We're all sick, body, mind, and soul. And Beverly points out that Jesus' love is not fickle. Very good. Very good comment. Our, our love is sometimes, it vacillates, it goes up and down, kind of like a Kind of like a, a roller coaster, whereas the love of Christ is strong. Others, Martha said, he is my love and my hope, and I believe in him. For some, he's your life and your love. So I think that all of you I think all of you are, are called, you're all called to take a walk. You're all called to take a walk with Jesus on the shore of Lake Galilee.
and talk to the Lord. Listen to the Lord. For Pedro, he's my Lord and Savior. All of your responses are very, very beautiful. And many of you have different ways in which you can address the Lord. Indeed, this is a way, my friends, in which we can grow deeper in our prayer life by talking to the Lord, expressing your love for the Lord and the different beautiful titles that the church has given to him. And many of the titles that you have given are actually, they're biblical. These are called Christological titles. Christological titles. So Peter, by, by giving the keys, Peter, by giving the, by giving these the keys, and by giving the role as the good shepherd, he will be the successor of Christ. So Jesus said, I do not call you as I do not call you orphans. And Jesus said, I'll be with you always until the end of time. Lisa has said, Jesus is my almighty God who loves me with the greatest love of all. Beautiful. Many of your comments are enriching me in our perseverance conversation. So Lisa has combined two different attributes. Almighty means he's powerful, but also his great love. His great love. Valerie has pointed out, it is a very beautiful topic. So invite invite all of you in your holy hour to, to take a walk with the Lord. Take a walk with the Lord. And Jesus perhaps is going to look in your eyes and say, well, do you love me? And he may even ask you that three times. Do you love me? What will, re, what will you respond to that? Maybe you respond somewhat like Peter, but you probably have your own, your own way of expressing yourself to Christ. Jesus is the best of speakers, but also Jesus is the best of listeners. Not only does Jesus listen with his ears, but also he listens with his heart. Grace has said his love is unconditional. Beautiful. You know, responding to what Grace has written, I'm going to tell you one of the tactics of the devil. I'm going to tell you one of the tactics of the devil. You know, the devil is never far away. Often, before a great victory, the devil is there to throw mud at us. Is I think what I'm going to say now, you all understand, when we fail and only God is perfect, Bible says that the just man falls seven times a day. But when we do fall, perhaps into the same rut, then we have the thought, well, well, God, God loves me less, or maybe he doesn't even love me. God loves me less, or maybe he doesn't even love me. Yesterday in my Spanish Mass, I, I gave this, uh, <coughs> I told this story, building upon what Grace Baisley has said, Jesus is unconditional love. Now, most of you, 
most of you with us are our mothers, some of you are even grand grandmothers. Let me present to you a scenario that I think you all understand. Okay, try to imagine you have two daughters. One is six years old and the other one is eight. And they're outside your home the day before it has rained. The six-year-old is learning how to ride her bike and she's kind of struggling. Whereas the eight-year-old is skipping and jumping and singing. She's just filled with a lot of joy. So you look out the window and all of a sudden you notice the little one the six-year-old daughter, she's struggling on the bike. The bike is wobbling and she falls off the bike into the gutter, into the mud puddle. And she's, she's burst into tears. She scraped her knee dirtied her dress. That moment you open up the door, you rush out, you take her in your arms, you bring her into the house, you give her a hug, you bathe her, you prepare her a cup of hot chocolate, and some chocolate chip cookies. And you wipe and you clean her booboo, her little, <laughs> her little cut. And off she goes to play again. Now those two daughters, which of the two, which of the two did you manifest a more intense love for in that scene. Of course, it would be the little girl, your little daughter that fell off her bike and fell into the mud puddle and cut her knee. That story is you and that story is me. We all get on the bike at times and the bike might be wobbling. We fall off the bike into the mud puddle. Perhaps we are wailing within, angry inside. My friends, that's the time in which God, in his tender love, mercy, compassion, wants to manifest to us even greater love for us. Not simply when the sun is shining, the birds are singing, the fragrance of the spring flowers, redolent with their radiance, are we breathing in, but rather when we fall off the bike into the mud puddle, we cut our knee and we dirty, we dirty our pants. In a certain sense, was Mary Jo says, in those times, he even carries us. You probably know that story, the footsteps in the sand. You see two sets of footsteps, but there's one set of footsteps, and that's when God was carrying us in his arms when we were carrying the heaviest of crosses. I think all of you who are mothers can identify with that story. And then maybe it even did happen like that in one way or another. So one of the ways that the devil works on us 
is to try to convince us into believing that when we fall off our bike into the mud puddle, which is an image of falling into sin, like the prodigal son, the temptation is that God, God doesn't love us. God doesn't love us, or he loves us less than at other times. That's a temptation of the devil. The devil wants to sow seeds of doubt within us. Trying to convince us that we've, we're falling into the same mud puddle. <coughs> we're never going to get out of it. We're falling in the mud puddle. We're never going to get out of it. We are a basket case. I once heard a funny story. Moses was a basket case, and look how he turned out. Do you like that one? <laughs> Moses was a basket case in the papyrus basket, and he became one of the greatest leaders in the Bible. Perhaps we have been basket cases, but God can rescue us from the Nile River, huh? He can rescue us from the mud puddle, from the Nile River. And God can do great things in us. The Lord, as Mary says, the Lord has done great things in me and holy is his name. So there we have the person of Peter with the key. We're going back to the image is the two statues with the key and the other one has the sword. And the other one with the sword, of course, is the Apostle St. Paul. He's got the sword for more than one reason. The first reason, and perhaps some of you saw the movie, The Apostle St. Paul, with Jim Caviezel. With Jim Caviezel. In that movie, you probably remember that Jim Caviezel was St. Luke, and he was visiting St. Paul, who was in prison arrest, home arrest, in the Mamertine prison in Rome itself. So St. Paul hold, holds a sword because that's the way that he would die. And he also has the sword Because St. Paul will go on to compare the Bible, <coughs> the Bible, the Word of God, to a sword. But not only a sword, but a two-edged sword. Paul says it separates marrow from, marrow from bone. So those would be the two interpretations of the sword that the great Apostle Paul has in his hands in the statue facing the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome. So both St. Peter and St. Paul would end up by sanctifying the city of Rome, <coughs> where they both will die as martyrs.
As mentioned before, St. Paul will die by the sword. And one of the reasons why Paul would not be crucified was because St. Paul also was a Roman citizen. And the crucifixion was considered the worst death penalty imaginable. So consequently, Saul, Paul rather, would be decapitated. His head would be chopped off. And that's the way by mean the means by which Saint Paul would glorify God. Now returning to Saint Peter, Saint Peter was not a Roman citizen. He was a Galilean. During the violent persecution of Nero, who persecuted and put to death many early Christians, in the amphitheater, in the mouth of the lions, and even burning Christians as human torches, Peter would be crucified. According to tradition, Peter was fleeing from Rome and he met Jesus carrying the cross and Peter says, Domino quo vadis. Domino quo vadis is the Latin for Lord, where are you going? And Jesus says, I'm going back to Rome to be crucified again. Peter understood that that was meant for him. So Peter goes back. And on one of the hills where now you have the Basilica of St. Peter, the Capitoline Hills. Peter was crucified. But Peter said this, Do not crucify me the way the Lord was. I'm not worthy. Crucify me upside down. Crucify me upside down. And that's exactly what happened. Peter was bound and he was crucified upside down. So my friends, let's pray for each other. I'll place all of you on the altar in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Let us profess our faithfulness to the teachings of the Magisterian and to Holy Mother Church in honor of St. Peter. In an honor of the great apostle St. Paul, let us all strive to grow in our love for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's pray that at the end of our lives, Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be the very center of our lives. Let's pray that we'll be able to say with St. Paul, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me.
The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it.